Welcome to Melanated Rising, where we inspire, uplift, and ignite Black creatives, all while changing the narratives around Blackness. What does it mean to exist Black in this world today with our many intersections? That's exactly what we explore, the challenges, the beauty, and the brilliance. Every episode is a look at what is possible when Black creatives stand in our undeniable power. I am your host, Kristen Iris. And I'm Cheryl Conti. Welcome to Melanated Rising. We are back for another episode. And we have today Cheryl Conti, who is going to help all of you budding entrepreneurs, beginning entrepreneurs, even maybe established entrepreneurs. So this is going to be a fun conversation. Let me tell you a little bit about our guest host today. Cheryl Conti is the award-winning CEO of the digital agency Do Big Things, a diverse team that is using a new narrative and new tech to create global change in a new era. Previously, Cheryl was CEO of Fission Strategy, which brought Silicon, uh, Silicon Valley startup culture to the world's leading causes and campaigns. She's the co-founder of Attentively, the first tech startup with a black female founder to be acquired by a NASDAQ company, the national board chair for Net. Netroots Nation, an affiliate of Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, and a proud co-founder of Hashtag Yes We Code. Welcome to the show, Cheryl. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm so excited, you know, to be with you, you know, with uh, you also who are listening to this podcast. I can't wait to talk. Yes. All right. So I start everyone with a question, and that question is, what narratives around Blackness are you challenging or changing? Oh, well, uh, one of them is you can't be Black and be a nerd, mm. right? <laughs> There's even a word for it, which most people probably don't know, which is blurred. Yep, <laughs> blurred. But, you know, Black people like Star Wars too, okay? Like, we're all up in that Lance Calrissian, okay? Give it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. It was who I grew up with. But yeah, you know, I think, you know, and the, the book is all about my journey in the startup world, right? The tech startup world, uh, the world of Mark, of a Mark Zuckerberg or a Jeff Bezos, um, you know, or uh, a Mark Benioff. And you, you might notice a theme in those people. Those are all white dudes. And, you know, no diss on white dudes, you know, they get up to some interesting stuff, but you know, tech is not a thing that is, uh, you know, it is not, it should not and cannot be the province of only one type of person. You know, we can't solve all of the uh, problems, you know, of the world if we're only seeing those problems or coming up with ideas from one perspective. You know, we really, you know, in order to continue to have a strong economy, you know, and a strong nation, you know, we need to unleash the creative talents you know, and the ideas, all of the products and services and apps, you know, from a wide host of folks. So that's what I, why I wrote the book. You know, the, you know, Mechanical Bull, how you can achieve startup success. There's a little bit of personal narrative of just mm -hmm. what was it like? You know, what is it like to be a black woman in the startup, the tech startup world? But it's also very much uh, practical advice on how to navigate the startup life cycle from start. Like, are you really an entrepreneur? Right, like it, it seems glamorous, <laughs> yeah. right? To be an it's entrepreneur, be your own boss, right? <laughs> to be your own boss, to set your own hours, uh -huh. to work from home in your pajamas. But the real, the real dope. Okay, and I know you know this, Kristen, is that <laughs> if you are at home working in your pajamas, is because a you don't have enough money to afford an office, and b uh, you don't have time to put on pants. Okay, that's why <laughs> you're working. In pajamas. So, like, if that still sounds sexy and appealing to you, <laughs> maybe you're an entrepreneur. Uh, but all the way through, you know, are you an entrepreneur to what is it like to exit, right? Like, what are the things you need to know to get to that point where, you know, someone, a larger entity says, I want to buy this business, right, from you, right? So, it's all the way through the life cycle and just all of the tips and tricks and info you need you know, to, to get through each milestone. Uh, every chapter has a little speed bump, right? Of like, hey, you know, here's the, the normal startup experience, but if you're a woman or a minority, or God help you both, 
you know, here's the thing that might happen at this, you know, at this juncture that you need to know, and here's how to deal with it. Yeah. Okay. So there, there are a lot of things in here. Now, one of the things that I, I know you talk about is like a lot of startup culture and resources and guidelines are made for, I think it was phrases like, you know, a, a white guy who dropped out of college or whatever, and you know, who's got certain resources or access or things like that. And they're not really geared towards people like us. And I think, I think this is interesting because we talk about in, in society and in uh, like social justice, the voices that don't get, the voices that don't get heard. And that when we're only looking at things, like you said, from a certain perspective, and we're only looking at them really from the privileged perspective and the people who are in, not only in power, but in a power that actually oppresses other people, then you're only, you're not only seeing one perspective, but that perspective continues to oppress other people. And so now, you know, you could see that with like people with disabilities, with um, black or people of color with disabilities, that the ways that that they're not being heard, the ways that they're not being um, factored in or, or listened to or even considered. And it, it's now, now you're showing a perspective in tech, like how are in tech and in startup and in business, how, how it's different for women, women of color, <laughs> you know, any kind of minority, like we come, we often come from a different, a different background or we have less access to resources or not even, even if we have access to resources, there is just the very fact that we are looked at differently. We are looked at in a way where we have to prove ourselves more, where we have to show up differently. And so those are things that are never talked about in, in these like books about business and stuff like that. And it's like, so we're getting all this guidance really from like our, our oppressors (laughs) and it's not working for us. (laughs) Yeah, well, and you know, it's worked for the colonizers, right? But you know, it might not work from for you. And, you know, what I have found, you know, from my white colleagues, you know, or, or male colleagues, you know, there are stories in the book where they're like, that never happened to me, right? The thing that you described is just a thing that I had no idea was going on. And so it's valuable for them. And, you know, in every chapter I have uh, also, or most chapters, uh, a little section called investor eye-opener, which along with the speed bump, it's like, hey, are you an investor who picked this book up in order to better understand, right, how to help founders like me get over these, you know, these challenges, you know, here's something that you might not realize would be helpful at this moment, specifically for, for a non-traditional founder, right? Like you want to be helpful, here's what they probably need and might not even know how to tell you. Mm. Oh, I like that. So you're, you're talking to both people who are in startup and people who are investing in startups. Exactly. Cause you know, this is also the kind of book that I hope, you know, investors will, will buy for their founders, right? Particularly the non-traditional founders. Cause look, here's an example, right? Of what you were just talking about of, you know, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the books out there are written, you know, from a certain perspective. So the friends and family, right? right? You've probably heard of this where you know, the friends of family round is, you know, intended to be a round of funding where you've gone around and asked, you know, your, you know, family friends and, you know, your, your fam, you know, for money, right? To invest mm-hmm. in your business. And it's seen as kind of a, you know, okay, you're really serious about this business. And yet, look, if you're a black or brown technologist in particular, you're already making the most money in your family. Okay. Like you're, you know, like you're, People are asking you for money. Like there isn't like the the friends and family round is just a non-starter. Like it's not going to happen, you know, for most, you know, so for, you know, here's a great example. Like a friend of mine, you know, his grandmother passed away. She left him $600,000 and he quit his job and started coding and started, you know, started his, you know, now, you know, very you know, sizable business, but like if you're black or brown, the likelihood that anything like that is going to happen to you in an America, okay, where, mm-hmm. you know, the, you know, the average black family wealth is 10 cents to a, a white family's dollar, like no one is going to die and leave you $600,000, okay, yeah. there is no friends and family round, so you, you know, that means that, you know, for, if you're the, the entrepreneur, you know, you need to, talk about that right away, right? That, you know, you need early seed capital and more, you know, and if you're an investor, right, it means that you need to not assume that this person has a cushion, 
right? There's no cushion for this person, right? Like they, you know, if you're, you need to invest in them such that they have enough to quit their job, right? And to, you know, focus on this full time, which means probably more early seed capital than, than you might have been expecting because there's no, there's no uncle, you know, who can put up a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. That's not going to happen. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like this is like the friends and family round. Um, it's something I've seen it. And because I haven't looked for investors, like that's not, it's not something that I have, have gone into. It's not something that I'm really looking to go into right now, but in other areas in business, they are like, Oh, we'll talk to your friends and family and get your friends and family to subscribe or whatever. And I'm like, my friends and family are not into this. I mean, now I have friends who are entrepreneurs. Now I have friends who are, because I had to go in those circles. But like when I was in the very, very beginnings and just starting, I'm like, I'm the first person in my family to run a business. You know, I am, I mean, as far as I can think, like there isn't anyone in my, like, I didn't learn this from anyone. I didn't have anyone who had like something going like, you know, so I, I completely, I completely see what you're saying. And I, I think in the moment I was just like, okay there was this feeling of this isn't going to work for me, but this is the advice I'm getting. So I should try it anyway. And of course it didn't work because they were like, why I'm not interested in this topic at all. Like I have not, you know, like, I mean, it was a different business than what I'm doing now, but it's like, people are just like, this has nothing to do with me. I'm not in this arena. Like, yay. It's, it's okay. Good. You're doing that. You know, but there wasn't like really that support that they're like, go, go to your friends and family. It's like, this is, I'm doing something new. Like I'm, I'm actually breaking at that time. I'm like, I'm breaking new ground in the people that I'm around. There aren't people who are there with me yet. So there was that feeling of like, something here isn't going to work. I don't really know what to do about that, but I'm going to follow the advice anyway. And now you're laying it out as like, these are things that don't necessarily work for us. And I think that's so important because it would have saved me a lot of time in the beginning so actually, I'm just going to say it straight. It would have saved me a lot of time in the beginning to learn from black entrepreneurs instead of learning from white people, because everybody that I was following were like all of the, the like white leaders in, in various industries, but in online business. And they, like you said, the things, not that they were necessarily using colonizer techniques, but <laughs> There are things that it's just like, you guys don't under, you don't understand what's happening on my end as a black woman with no cushion, no capital, no nothing. Who's just trying to make this thing happen and also trying to like pay my bills. You know, like these are people who don't under who don't understand because they're not black or they're not a black woman, you know? And so I would just would have saved a lot more trouble or a lot of like trouble if I had been learning from black people in the beginning, like people like you who had to navigate that space already. And we're like, Hey, here's what you need to know. <laughs> right. Here's, what the, here's what's useful, you know, and right. You know, and for them again, you know, a lot of them, they're just coming from a different place, you yes. know, and, and they're trying to share what worked for them or the advice, but right. If you're, especially if you're a black woman, but I would say, you know, black, you know, male or female, right. You're starting with less cushion, less capital, less connections, Right. Like your, you know, your reality in terms of how to get, start to get your, your concept off the ground and into a real business, you know, you're just starting from a very different place. And so I really try to go there. And even, you know, the, the beginning of the book, you know, I, I would say head straight into that of like, look, you know, probably in your family, there aren't a lot of people who have launched successful businesses, you know, in, in a lot of at least black families, you know, success looks like becoming a doctor or a lawyer, or if your parents knew what one was, an engineer, okay, like that, like this is, or work for the government, right, work for the post office. I mean, that was actually the advice that my grandfather on one side and my uncle gave, on the other side gave my tween brother, and I was like, look, if it all goes sideways, you can always get a job at the post office. Like, that was their life advice, Okay. Right, and so that's like if you're starting from there, right? Like this is you know like the, the path to a different place. Like, the path to entrepreneurship is good. you know like you just have less, you know you just don't have the same kind of backing or even like 
like I said, you know, that you don't have the rich uncle or aunt, you know, who has started their own business or family friend to turn to down the street to give you advice. So, you know, I really wrote this book for, for all of those people who are just like, yeah, you know what, you know, what's the 411? How do you actually, you know, I have aspirations. I have a great idea. I really think that this can help improve people's lives, but I don't know where to start. And then once I get started, I just, I don't know the lingo, right? Like, I don't know the websites I'm supposed to be looking at. What is a pitch deck? And then who do I show it to? You know, it's just all of those nuts and bolts. Yes. Now, something you said about the, like how your family um, or how, you know, if you come from a black or a, a brown family that the success, like lawyer, doctor, maybe engineer, post office is your safety, <laughs> you know? And this, I love that you said that because it just sparked in me the, the idea that, or not the idea, but really the reality of that for a lot of black families, your parents want security for you because they've worked so hard to survive and their parents worked so hard to survive and they worked hard to bring us here so that we could have it a little easier. And there is a lot of um, directing us towards what's a safe route and telling us like, this is what you should do because this will bring you money and this will secure, you know, your finances for a family and this will, and it's like, but there isn't um, a lot of time and, and this, not necessarily in my family, but this is something that I've heard from a lot of people and a, like a lot of black people, I mean, is this not, I don't want to say lack of support because I don't want to say black families aren't supportive. That's not what I mean. But there is like a, a push towards what's secure. And on our end, as the people who are taking risks, who are trying new things, it can feel like a lack of support. It can feel like they don't get what I'm doing. They don't understand me. They're not supportive because they're constantly telling me to do this other thing instead. And I have felt that a little bit in some ways in my family, not as much as like, you know, I've talked to other people where they feel it more or where they feel like their family is just outright not supportive. And it's like our families are, they want us to be safe and they want us to be secure. And that is more important to them. And I understand why, because we as a people have had to operate from survival for so long, but it puts us in this position of, it can be different a lot of times than our white counterparts who maybe their parents took risks or built a business or, you know, came from money so they could fuck around all they wanted. Um, and, and they could be like, oh yeah, you can screw up or you could do this or whatever. And they still have like someone there to help them. And that's a totally different story for us because a lot of us are like, we are going against the grain of what is such a, a cultural norm in our family. And because our families are, can be such tight communities because we've had to be to support each other, that can be even harder to break away from. And it creates such a, a different dynamic in how we engage with the people around us and with our families. And that's not something that really gets addressed by, um, you know, white entrepreneurs or right, white entrepreneurial leaders, they don't talk about how to even, how to even deal with that. Cause we do have that, do this. You could, you could work at the post office. You know, my mom, my mom will do that. She should be like, well, you know, I mean, you could get a job at like blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, why would I do that? <laughs> like, I understand what you're trying. I was like, hey, Target like, got jobs. I'm like, I, Target I, has I'm jobs. Like, I understand. She's like, you, know, you, can get a, you can get a job. I don't even know like what the suggestion was, but it was something where I imagined an office and I was like, no, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. no completely. No, no everything no. you said is in tracks. And, and that's why I addressed it in the book, right. Of just like, you know, our, you know, of like my journey in terms of entrepreneurship, like, you know, there just weren't really any models in my family for that. And, you know, it's not that we weren't successful, you know, successful middle-class, you know, hardworking taxpaying black family on both sides, but, you know, entre you know, most of that success was just found in different venues that, that frankly were more open and supportive, um, you know, to, to black people, you know, of a prior generation. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, you are going to, you know, you are going to face some folks who say, well, you know, who just scratch their heads and don't have any, don't know what you're talking about. I mean, my own mother, you know, whom I love, you know, it, took, it was a long time before she could even describe kind of what I do beyond like Cheryl works on the internet and she seems to be doing just fine. <laughs> yeah. it was kind she doesn't of, quite get it, but she's like, it's working. It's working. It, it seems to be working. I mean, now she can, you know, she's got the whole spiel. She's got yeah. it all down. But there, you know, there was definitely a time period where she was just like, I don't, I don't 
really understand what you do for a living. I, I think that's my problem like, right now. She's like, so you're just, you're just never going to work for anyone. And I'm like, no, like that's the plan. <laughs> the plan is to never work for anyone. I'm like, why would I work for someone when I'm trying to work for myself? It's just like, oh, right. And it's just so okay, different for them. If you want to, I'm like, okay. Yeah, it's very different. But you know, th that is something I address in the book, you know, that just like that being part of our story. But also, you know, I think for um, black and brown entrepreneurs, in particular, and women, you know, the the risk also seems a lot higher for us, right? Like, you know, because we're doing something new and different, you know, and, and you know, for a, a lot of you listening, you're already seen as a star in your family. And to take that risk, feels like, oh, am I going to let people down? Like, what if I don't yes. succeed? And my, you know, like the cost feels really high, right? Or if I don't succeed, will I be able to find another position again? You know, and what I can tell you is that also, you know, you're, you know, folks are operating from, you know, uh, you know, a fault, a false dichotomy, right? You know, even, you know, I used to wonder living out here in Silicon Valley, you know, how could it be that if you, if your startup fails, that you get a better job. Like, how does that even, is that just like classic failing up? Like, you know, <laughs> how, does even, how does that even work? But, you know, having, having been through it myself, I totally get it, Kristen. I mean, you know, it, even if our startup had failed, which thank God it did not, but even if it had failed, I have a PhD in this stuff now right? And just start up in business. And, you know, you know, 90% of American small businesses will fail in the first year. So there's a really good chance that your business is not going to make it. But any savvy executive who would hire you next understands that, you know, there are all kinds of different reasons why a business might not make it that have nothing to do with you as a person. Mm -hmm. And in fact, your startup experience you know, you now have, you know, a level of executive, of executive experience that quali does qualify you for, you know, the next rung up the ladder of, of more senior experience. And so there's really only gain for you because, you know, you, you know, an executive seeing you says, okay, you know, the business didn't work out, but here's someone who has ambition, who has drive, who is smart, right? You know, who's willing to work hard, um, you know, who has, who has managed people or who, you know, who has had to promote their business, has had to look at accounts payable and accounts receivable. You know, you're just qualified for a different level of authority and management than you were before. And so, you know, that's the other thing I really want people to take away from the book is that you can't fail, right? Even failure, you know, it, with a startup is not failure. And in fact, it, the, the, the reward for that risk, you know, might look different than you may expect. Ooh, I, so, <laughs> so um, everything that you said there, that's a really great way to reframe it. And um, it's interesting because, it, so I'm, I'm a martial artist as well. And one of the things that, that they say sometimes, like one of the sayings is like, you either you don't, it's not that you win or lose, you win or you learn. Um, and so even if you like lose a match, it's, it's not like you're a failure. You learn from it. You learn like, where did you, you know, like, where did you misstep? Where did you, where, did, where do you need to do things differently? And I feel like too often we don't bring that into business because I'll be like, I've had several, I've had several businesses and like, I started several businesses, but um, they weren't really successful. And there is that, that feeling of like, oh, I failed or what's this going to say about me? And it's like, honestly, I just needed to keep redirecting until I got to where I am now where I'm like, oh, this is what I really need to be doing. Um, and so it's, it's like, even if they had, you know, finger quotes succeeded, like, I would have, I would have ended up changing anyway and been like, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I want to, I want to do this over here and shift. But that I, that mentality, um, we will take our successes and our failures, you know, with quotes around them, our successes and failures and use them as like a validation or a valuation level of who we are as people. You know, exactly. like where I am. I am like a more worthy human being because I am successful according to whatever standard that isn't even my own standard, or I am less worthy because this project failed or this business failed. And now I need to prove myself in some other way, or I need to hide that. I need to, I need to shove that in the closet and not let them know that I failed because then, I'm, then they're going to think less of me as like a human being 
So we take it as this valuation of us as human beings, and that really messes us up mentally. <laughs> well, because there's, there's so many ways. I mean, you know, you talked about being safe, you know, secure, you know, our value. And, you know, as Black people, you know, there's a lot of messages, you know, that we receive every day that we're not safe, that we're not secure, that we're not valued. And so, you know, it, you do have to make sure that, you know, look, no one is going to have more belief and confidence in you and in your business concept than you. Okay. So, you know, you've got to start there and that's true no matter what color you are, but particularly if you're black, brown, female, like you've got to bring all of the confidence. Okay. All of the noise, um, you know, in order uh, to make it happen. And then the other thing I want to riff off that you mentioned was, you know, that you, you know, started something and then change and that's normal. Yeah. Just, that's a normal part of the process. Lean Startup is another great book. Um, it, it in part is what inspired Mechanical Bull. But uh, Lean Startup, you know, talks a lot about the pivot, right? And where you start something. And then at some point you figure out, okay, you know, this is what people really like about this thing, right? And I need to head more in that direction. Or like, oh, I thought I was solving this problem. But in fact, what people really need is this solution. Boop you know, and, and you pivot and that's normal and, and mm -hmm. expect it, you know, it, in fact, if you that's don't, not what pivot, we're taught. if you, right, that's not As what you know. People, it was, you go and you follow a track and then you have a career and a single career and you follow that career until you die. <laughs> there right. is no, like, it sounds I have like, multiple passions. Let me go in different directions. Let me change it up when I'm 32 or whatever. Like that doesn't happen. <laughs> what? You have kids, you have a family, you can't change it up. What are you doing? Well, exactly. And it sounds like, you know, dithering, right? For a certain generation, there's like, well, you know, I was, you know, I was a teacher for, you know, one of my aunts was a teacher for 30 years. They're just like, there's no pivoting in, mm -hmm. in you know, like, you know, the pivot might be, well, I was teaching ninth grade and now I'm teaching 11th grade. Like, you know, there's just, but there's no pivoting where, you know, it's actually expected in the startup world that at some point, you know, you will pivot. And, you know, that's an important note is that for particularly at the seed stage, um, which is the early stage of investing, investors are really investing in you, the person. They're not necessarily, you know, the, the, you know, the concept is interesting, right? And, you know, obviously, you know, that's a part of it, but ultimately, you know, they're banking that you, the person, the founder and the founding team is going to be smart enough and adaptable you know, resourceful enough to, to notice, to adapt, right, to change with market conditions, right, and with new information. Uh, and they are looking for that. You know, they'll actually ask you questions in the process to kind of test, like, is this person open to new information, right? And I have found, you know, particularly black and brown entrepreneurs often you know, they miss those cues, you know, they'll go in and they're just like super focused and they think that the way to impress the investor is to just be like, you know, in response to, to questions, it's just like, no, no, we're not going to do that. Like we would never consider that. Like I'm only doing this one thing. It's like, yeah, okay. You know, I, I was mentoring, you know, I, this isn't in the book, but I was mentoring uh, a young person who wanted to start a content network kind of in competition with, um, you know, Hulu and, you know, the, but was focused on, you know, certain types of, you know, black and brown stories. And I was like, well, that's great. You know, and, and her plan was to have advertising be, you know, the main driver of sales. And I was like, well, you know, if you look at sort of your larger competitors, I mean, these are the people you're really competing against for entertainment. They're not really doing ads. They're doing subscriptions. And she was like, yeah, but other people, have, you know, like she really like, you know, went hard on the ad thing. And I was like, girl, you know, you're, I'm not sure. Do you know who you're talking? Like <laughs> I sold the business to a large corporation. So like, let me, you know, uh, well, and so then I finally had to ask her, I was like, okay, these people who are advising you, have they ever purchased digital ads? She's like, oh, well, no. I was like, okay, have they sold digital ads? Because I've done both. So like, let me like share with you, you know, why that's probably not going to be a great strategy for you, you know, you know, and you might want to rethink your, your, your pricing model and your business model. Um, so, you know, it's that kind of thing that, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you're in that room with the investor, like they want to hear that you can take in new information, right. That you might not know from your limited expertise, right. From other people who have more experience and be open and be like, Hmm, I hadn't considered that or like, let me think about that. Or like, we should do some market research on that. Like, thank you. 
right? Thank you is really what the investor is looking for because you know a really good investor is investing not just money in you, right? You know they they're really wanting to help you. They have been successful, right? In what they've been doing, they are they could put their money in much safer. Okay, like there's a really good chance they're going to blow up their money, right? You know they're they you know they could put their money in much safer uh, vehicles, you know uh, investment vehicles. You know they're investing in you because they want to help you. Right. So, you know, I, I would encourage people. There's a whole chapter on investor relations because um, I think that this is really important. And then finally, you know, I think the thing that I see often with black and brown entrepreneurs and even some women is uh, the, co the concept of the army of one. Right. And, you know, yeah, you, you know what I'm talking about, Kristen, I'm, right? I'm just I'm a solopreneur, so <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'm gonna I am doing it. I'm doing it solo right now. So yeah. <laughs> Which I think, you know, for certain types of things you it can works, be a solopreneur. Yeah, for certain types of, you know, products or services, you know, it can work. But oftentimes, you know, if you're looking for seed capital, ultimately, you know, they're looking for who's your team. You cannot do it all. You are not all things. You are not good at all the things. That person does not exist. Instead, they're looking for, is there some kind of acknowledgement of, do you know what you're good at? And do you understand, even if you haven't filled those roles yet, have, do you understand the roles that you need, you know, in order to really get this, this thing off the ground uh, and into the market? Um, so that's something important to think about is that, you know, you need, you know, you yourself might be the visionary. That's probably you, Kristen, you seem like, <laughs> yeah. you know, but do you have the geek on board? You know, who's the person who's your tech lead? You know, who's your sales and marketing lead? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're building a thing, do you have anyone in your team who knows anything about manufacturing and has those relationships? Do you have an advisor on board, you know, someone you can tap into who knows more than you about this thing. You know, those are some of the basic roles. You know, do you have a product person? You know, someone who's really focused on on product. Do you have a customer success person? You know, have you started to think about that? Of you know, once people are on board, you know, how are you making sure they're using the product, they're happy with it? So, you know, those are some of the roles that you know a good investor is going to look for again you might not know all of those people yet but even just identifying like these are the roles i have to fill and i'm looking for investors and partners who can help me fill these roles that's what that's what a savvy investor is looking for mm, that's good information to have um so what because i like like for my business right now like my business isn't one that i would really look for i guess seed capital right now um Although there are some things I'm thinking about that I'm like, oh, maybe I could bring in some, maybe I could bring in some funds for this. But like, what are the kinds of businesses that maybe people are trying to go it alone, but they could really, they could really do with considering, you know, trying to find investors and, and seed capital and things like that? Oh, that's a great question. And I actually have a chapter in the book called Bootstrapper Funding. Right. And so, you know, with our um, first business, uh, we bootstrapped it, you know, for 18 months internally. You know, whereby, you know, we just used excess developer time, we use some of our time to sell it, you know, to just build the prototype and start to get customers. So you can you can actually to a certain extent, and especially for those of you who have the side hustle, right? You're already doing it, right? You're already in the bootstrap phase mm -hmm. where you've got your side hustle going and you're you know trying to get get it to lift off. You know, I would say not everyone needs a capital infusion. For sure, you know it does depend on you know your market, you know, and and you know your product or your service. Certainly, if you are building an app, you know, like a you know a, a full a fully functional app, you know that has a lot of functionality. You know, if you have a product like a physical product that you have to manufacture, like at some point, ideally, you're going to get to a point where you doing it on your own on the weekends is not enough, right? And you you need to hire people. And so that's a good time to start looking at, okay, I need some additional capital. Where am I gonna get it from? I mean, obviously you can go into your own personal debt, you know, that is an option, but ideally, you know, you're starting to talk to banks, you know, or, you know, there's actually a whole bunch of websites now, you know, Cabbage, Blue Vine, nerd wallet you know there are all these other places where you can you know start to look online for you know other ways to finance your business but yeah you know i would say you know there are services services businesses 
you know, you don't always need capital, you know, a lot of capital to raise that. You know, I started um, our original digital agency, uh, Fission Strategy, you know, my business partner and I each had 10K in the bank. And that had to last us, you know, for a month or two, right? I was like, if we don't, if we can't get customers, we can't get clients in the next month or two, like, I can't do this. This is all the money that I have. Like, this is it. So, you know, I think that, that, you know, but, you know, a services business where, you know, you're providing a service for a fee, you know, these businesses, you can start to expand, you know, over time based on bookings without necessarily, you know, pulling in extra capital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a little bit more of what, what I do. Um, yeah, you're providing a service. So what about for, I guess, I, I wonder if there's like any myth busting that can happen here in terms of like people who don't want to bring in investors because they don't want to lose like the power and the control over their company. Um, can you speak to that at all about like what, what bringing an investor really means if there are actual dangers that people do need to be worried about or dangers that people think they need to be worried about that are actually like not a concern or that are easily remedied. Yeah, that, no, that's a good, and again, you know, part of this is the trust, right? I mean, you know, in every black family, you can probably hear a story of that time that somebody got ripped off by somebody, right? Mm. And took it, taken advantage of. I know I could recite several stories right now of like when it all went wrong um, because someone trusted. So I get where that comes from. But, you know, the reason to take on investors is to get bigger faster, right? And, you know, again, in the, the right investors aren't just about money. You know, they're really bringing in resources, they're bringing in expertise, they're bringing in other connections to help you. And sure, you know, it does mean that you have to, you know, you start to share ownership. You know, you want to keep, maintain, make sure you're maintaining some primary control, um, you know, over, you know, enough enough shares that you feel like you can you know, maintain, you know, a firm grip on things. But, you know, what you get are just the ability to, you know, get much, you know, really build your dream a lot bigger and a lot faster than you would on your own. And again, that's especially true, I think, for, you know, people coming from, you know, different backgrounds for whom, you know, you're not sitting on, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, right, that you can just tap into and not be afraid of losing. You know, like that money is really if you have it, which is a big if, it's very precious, okay? It's meant for medical bills. Yep. Meant to buy auntie a house. <laughs> like, you know, someone's trying to get somebody to go to college. Like, this isn't money. Yeah, that someone's got to take care of someone's mom. You can't F with that money, right? Yeah. And so, you know, it's really, you know, and, and again, this is how, you know, this is how kind of the, you know, white guys, frankly, you know, did it for years. They weren't gambling with their own money. Right. You know, you don't want to gamble with your own money at the end of the day. Ideally, you know, you want to find, you know, you have the idea, you know, you want to find the person who has the, the capital, you know, and, and wants to support that bringing that idea into life and, and gets it and gets you. Um, so, you know, and again, you know, vet your investors, you know, ask people, you know, the investor community, while it has grown over the past few years, is still pretty small. So chances are, you know, once you have one investor, you know, you can start to ask them, well, how, what do you know about this person? What's their reputation? Look at, uh, look online, you know, get a sense for who they are, you know, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. People now, of course, you know, have, you know, social, you know, relationships, like, you know, try to get to know these people and really vet them yourselves, either personally, you know, through your connections or online, you know, and follow, finally follow your gut. Okay. Like the, you know, the, you know, your intuition is the smartest part of you. And for a lot of people that intuition, you know, it's not going to, you know, be an equation in your head or anything, right. It's going to be a gut feeling, right. An instinct, you know, uh, a, a nudge, you know, and that part, you know, that it's actually, you know, neuroscience tells us it takes millions of calculations you know, to get to that hunch, right? Or that gut feeling or that Ooh, instinct. That's interesting. So, right? It's really, backed by science, guys. <laughs> right? Science and your tummy are trying, you know, our, is our science and your tummy trying to tell you something, okay, about this person, mm -hmm. right? You'll know. And, you know, finally on that, I really recommend actually uh, Silicon Valley on HBO. That series, it's very broad. It's pretty crazy. 
no, not many people on there look, you know, like many of the people listening to this podcast. However, I will say even the titles of the shows are in education. They're all, you know, lingo from the startup world. Mm-hmm. And everything that happens, particularly in the first season, all of those things happened in some way to us during the life cycle. So from that standpoint, it's a more fun way to kind of get to get the feeling. But, you know, you get a sense of what investor relations look like in Silicon Valley, in the show. You know, they really part of the show is like teasing out that dynamic of what's it, what is what is a good investor look like? What is a bad investor look like? Right. How does that shake out? Um, so that, you know, Silicon Valley HBO on HBO is a really fun, a more fun way, uh, like my book, Mechanical Bull. Um, you know, to, to start to, you know, dip your toe in the startup world. Yeah. Now I, I like that this balance of like education, but also listening to your gut because I'm, I'm glad you touched on that because I feel like almost when it comes to intuition or that gut feeling, there are two things that happen with, with black people. And maybe, maybe I'll just speak to it from like my perspective, which is that I have a very strong intuition, but I had a very low level of trust in it and a very low level of trust in myself. And there is an element, I think, in our our history and our social and cultural conditioning and how we've had to navigate the world of like, you do, like you get, we get these signals, you know, and, and we, and we can, we can tell like, okay, something is like a danger. This is like, this is a danger. This is not good. Um, And so in some ways we've learned to like tap into that and listen to that. But it's also been a lot from a perspective of like, danger, danger, danger. And because of also other messaging in society about us being less intelligent or whatever, there's this lack of trust or this conditioned lack of trust in, our, in ourselves, in our own like internal intelligence. And this like, it's almost like hard for me to explain, but because we're constantly being told what to do, how we can do it, how we're allowed to show up. And we have to really fight for our autonomy. It, it creates that like almost like a disconnect because we're constantly being told that what we know and what we think is not true because some other colonizer is telling us something else, you know? And, and so we have to rebuild this trust with ourselves over time. Like as an adult, even just in the last two years, I've, I've changed my relationship to my level of trust in myself, my intuition. And now I follow it so much easier. And I, and once I started doing that, I was like, wow, I'm actually, I'm actually really intuitive and I haven't been listening to, to it this whole time. It's like, I've been feeling it this whole time and been like, but I don't know. Can I trust that? I don't know. Can I trust that? Is the, I can't trust that good feeling. Like, no, no, I can't go by that. Let me analyze it to death. And I'm a Virgo too. So like, I'm an analytical person. Like, yeah, you guys didn't see her face when I said that. <laughs> She's laughing right now. You know, my father was a Virgo. So like, I totally, and like, now that I'm a mom, like his Virgo tendencies, like I love labeling shit. <laughs> yeah. been, like it just makes me feel so good. And Organized. Like, 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 yes, label things. I know where things are. Right? I know put things in a box and then label the box. Yes. Mm. Yeah, so you guys like, I'm yeah, no, I get it. I'm an analytical person. And for years I was just like, oh, I'm not intuitive. I'm not intuitive. And then finally I was like, oh, I'm really intuitive. And I just didn't trust it because I've constantly been told by, by so many different experiences in society that like what I think it doesn't matter or that it's not right. And then it would end up being right. So I think there's this, this element of both things happening where we do have a really strong intuition because we had to have it to survive, but we've also been told to not trust it. And so we have to rebuild that with ourselves and, and learn how to use that in all areas like business and tech. Oh, completely. And I think black women are the queens of intuition, yeah, right? And the knowing, right? That deep, deep knowing that really, again, it is the smartest part of you. Um, and, and in some ways, you know, the, the, the most power of your, of your brain and action, even though it doesn't feel like your brain, you know, and, you know, you bring up an interesting point about the survival mechanism. So Cedric, the entertainer, he probably was at the Kings of comedy. I mm-hmm. think he had a bit where he said, you know, like, uh, you know, somebody, you know, you can just be smoking, you can just be a black man smoking on the corner, you know, uh, having a cigarette, and all of a sudden people start running, you don't ask questions, like, white people <laughs> ask questions and have a lot to say, and, like, black people just, like, would just take off running, then afterwards be like, oh, oh, God, what were we running from? <laughs> <What's that? laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so, right, you know, our intuition, I think there's been a lot of training around, like, 
the survival aspect, right? Of like, mm-hmm. you know, is someone making you feel uncomfortable? Or are you in a, are you physically threatened, right? Yes. In, in that moment, or is someone saying something that like sounds okay, but is actually super racist? Like, you know, we're, you know, we have our antenna up for those kinds of things, but those aren't the only things that our intuition can tell us. And those, these other things that we're talking about, like, Hmm, is this person really a good person to go into business with? Like, should I take their money or like, you know, does this idea, you know, is this team member, is this supplier or vendor, you know, is this the right one? Or like, does this idea really have legs? You know, those might be quieter instincts, right? Those might sound quieter. It's not the like, you know, like three, you know, alarm fire. red light. Right? It's like, <laughs> noob, noob, run, yeah. run down the street, stop run. asking questions. Um, you know, it's not a three alarm fire. It's more like a gentle, like, ting sha ding, you know, but like those dings are yeah. really important to listen to. There's a great book uh, besides mine that you should check out, uh, The Intuitive Businesswoman. Uh, I read that book a long time ago and it's just, it's so great in terms of like, right, answering this thing, you know, of like, you know, can you learn to trust yourself? Because yeah, as, as a businesswoman myself, I can tell you that, you know, learning to trust my instincts, uh, you know, it is a skill. Um, it is a skill that can make a big difference. And then finally, the other thing I'd tell people listening is relationships. Relations, I would not have been able to start my businesses without uh, the relationships, you know, that I've built over, over the years. And I definitely wouldn't have been able to keep them. I would not have been able to keep those businesses if it weren't for the relationships, you know, and the, the community, you know, that I see myself um, as part of. So, you know, build, you know, that's something you can do, even if you're not sure, you know, what, what business do I want to do? Like, do I want to become an entrepreneur? You know, no matter where you are in your, in your journey, you know, your career journey, you know, creating, you know, starting to cultivate those relationships, particularly using tools like LinkedIn, you know, like Twitter, like Facebook, like Instagram, um, you know, you'd be surprised how powerful that can be, even if it's just your circle. You know, there are people in your immediate circle, especially if you're young, over time, their jobs, they're going to rise in their jobs, right? And there, you guys are going to be able to help each other in different ways, more ways than you can imagine now. Um, so, and, you know, last thing I would say, you know, the, the job that you're preparing yourself for now might not exist yet. Oh, Certainly true. that was true that's of me, right? <laughs> right? I know that is like, I know that's sort of a, you know, a head scratcher, but look, you know, when I was in college, the, the job that I have now, which is CEO of a digital agency that, that works with causes and candidates to make the world a better place and, and uses digital to do that. It didn't exist. Those companies didn't exist. The job didn't exist, right? Like the technology didn't exist to do any of that, you know, but I was just following my, you know, interests, my dual passions in, you know, ethics, politics, and economics, and in nerdery, you know, and gadgets, and and, um, computers, (laughs) right, and the internet, like those, you know, those eventually started to, to come together, right? There was a way to, you know, to, 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 bring those passions together. But, you know, what I would say to folks, you know, to to folks listening is, you know, look, you know, follow your, your, follow your instincts, you know, follow your passions and and your interests. And you, especially if you're able to layer on, you know, a a technical, uh, you know, a technical aspect, you might be surprised, you know, of the, the career that you and the cohort, the community you create around you, you know, what, where you might find yourself in 10 or 20 years. Yeah, those are great, um, great nuggets to remember and things to keep in mind. I love that. Thank you so much for for sharing um, sharing all of this and for having this conversation. I think there are so many important elements here, especially as it applies to um, Black startups, Black entrepreneurs, and um, Black female entrepreneurs. So tell everyone where we can find you and where we can find your book. Yeah, well, you can find me uh, at dobigthings.today. Uh, that's our URL, or for those for whom that's challenging, dobigthings.com. Uh, and then also, uh, Mechanical Bull, How You Can Achieve Startup Success. The book is available uh, starting May 28th. Uh, so uh, it's on Amazon, it's in Kindle, and in um, 
in Kindle and in paperback. Excellent. And congrats, congratulations on uh, publishing your book. This is fantastic. Uh, so glad that we could have this conversation here, you know, um, at the kind of beginning of it, you know, of, of getting this completed and getting it out there in the world and what you're doing with it. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing all this. Everyone, please go check out uh, her book. Check out, go and, and follow her. Is there, where can people follow you on social? Uh, yeah, I'm Cheryl Conti on Instagram and on Twitter, Cheryl, C-H-3-R-Y-L. Easy to find. All right. Excellent. Yes. Go connect with her. Go learn things and build amazing things. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Kristen. All right, listeners, it's time to take some action. Go get your copy of Mechanical Bull. It just released yesterday, May 28th. So if you are listening to this episode, the week that it's released, the day that it's released, guess what? It is up on Amazon for just 99 cents. Mechanical Bull by Cheryl Conti. I have a link right there in the description to make it super easy for you to go and get your copy. And you know, I gotta say, people like Cheryl are exactly why I have this podcast, is to shine a light on the different ways that we have to navigate the world as black people. And this book that she has is a great guide for, you know, going against or not even listening to some of the things that we've been told because those things don't necessarily work for us. So this is a great way to explore navigating your startup, navigating getting investors and moving forward and building your business in a way that actually works for you as a black person. So go get your copy. And if you are enjoying the show, please make sure you subscribe so you get new episodes and rate and review on iTunes. It is the best way to help others find us and get this show out to more ears. And if you are an entrepreneur, if you're a creative, if you're someone who has a vision, before you go, make sure you get my copy of my free workbook for black creatives, Create Your Future Vision. You can get that at kristeniris.com slash vision. It'll take you through my step-by-step process for creating your future vision and bringing it into your everyday so you can gain massive momentum in whatever it is you're creating. If you would like to help support this podcast and the production of this podcast, please go over to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash melanatedrising. You can choose which tier that you would like to join on a monthly basis and your support helps keep this podcast going. As patrons, you do get access to my Instagram live replays after they've come down off of Instagram because they're only up there for 24 hours. So you have access to them um, privately and you also will get special access to exclusive afterthoughts videos for each episode. That's something that I just started with last week's episode and I want to keep it going. So you only get to see those if you are a patron it's a way of kind of expanding on what was talked about in the episode head over to patreon.com slash melanatedrising and go check it out thank you so much for tuning in to this episode and always remember to stand in your black creative power